here. Um, I'm Horacio Nastasi, by the way, so if you uh, need something uh, specific, please contact me. Um, so uh, just a few announcements. <clears throat> so a small schedule change. Uh, now it's corrected on the site and everywhere. So we had put the coffee break after Niels Ober's talk. Um, but it's better to put it after the colloquium, so now the coffee break is at 3.15, and Niels Ober's talk at 3.45, so. Um, another thing is, there's a sign-up sheet over there for the workshop dinner tomorrow at 8, at a restaurant called Bovinus. It's, uh, this time we'll, everybody will pay for their own, so it's uh, 75 reels and plus drinks. Um, and uh, finally, uh, for the people who have posters, you have noted that uh, poster sessions are basically the same as <laughs> coffee breaks. So please put up your posters uh, whenever appropriate. All right, uh, that's it. And let me give the uh, word to Carla. OK, so welcome to the, the first session in the, in the workshop, Hermann Berlinde. Um, Hermann, go for it. <laughs> yeah, OK, good. That's the title of your yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, I want to thank the organizers for, um, again, uh, yeah, organizing both uh, what was a stimulating school and now uh, this workshop. Um, so, um, I'm not sure if I actually gave a title, but at least when I thought about uh, what to talk about, uh, I indeed thought that um, at least, uh, although this is uh, 25 years of holography, and luckily indeed the, um, the title of, the, of the, yeah, both the, the school and the workshop uh, it's more general than, than purely ADS-CFT. Um, ADS-CFT, of course, has been there for 25 years as sort of a, the best example uh, of holography, but holography is a more general concept, um, at least vision, uh, of, of essentially trying to map um, uh, questions in, in, in quantum gravity to uh, questions in, in, or to systems that we can really study from the point of view of quantum mechanics. Um, so, uh, and in today's talk, indeed, I want to sort of, look, rather than looking back at the past 25 years, uh, look forward. Uh, and one of the challenges, indeed, is to try to understand um, uh, a sort of more realistic space times than the anti -Dicita space, and the Sitter is an example. So Juan uh, yeah, gave a, a beautiful uh, lecture yesterday where he asked, uh, yeah, showed some of the conceptual questions that come up when you start thinking about holography and the Sitter. Uh, and indeed, some of those questions indeed will come up in my lecture as well. But my motivation actually is coming uh, from uh, both the physical significance of the Zitter space, but also from a more formal um, a structure that came out of uh, studying um, uh, one of the toy models, basically, of holography, which is the SYK model in the double scaling limit. Uh, and the double scaling limit indeed has been solved uh, and has structures that really aim or uh, just look uh, like quantum uh, geometry of the Sitter space-time, and I'll try to explain how that works. So, let's see if this works, yeah. Um, so, let's start. Um, so, one of the uh, yeah, challenges, indeed, when one thinks about the Sitter holography is precisely what is the holographic screen. Um, in the case of the anti the Sitter space, it's kind of clear, it lifts at the boundary. In the case of the Sitter space, it's, it's less clear. They're kind of two candidates. Uh, one candidate uh, is to basically think about the Sitter space as an anti the Sitter space sort of turned on its side, and then the Sitter space has boundaries that are sort of the past and the future. Um, and, uh, but that immediately poses a problem that then, in that case, the boundary, the holographic screen is space-like, uh, and then essentially we're just talking about constructing wave functions, and that's still kind of a, a, a different story. Uh, one can take another point of view, uh, which is uh, where indeed one is looking at um, the static patch, meaning if you uh, imagine yourself just sitting in the sitter space, uh, then you have an observer horizon that sits sort of somewhere uh, at some distance away from you. Um, uh, and then if you're not moving, then essentially that's, that's your, again, your static patch. Um, the problem in that case is that there's kind of a, a natural kind of boundary, certainly from the point of view of the Penrose diagram. Uh, but the Penrose diagram, uh, and it will have that uh, edge. In the case of ADS-CFT, that edge is really where the non-compact boundary sits. In the case of the, the Citra space, that boundary uh, of, the, of the Penrose diagram is just the world line of, of the observer. And the horizon, in this case, is, are still those lines under 45 degrees. 
But since the observer is sitting right in the middle of, uh, of, uh, and of the sitter space time, gravity is not decoupled uh, and the holographic dictionary indeed becomes uh, more complicated because of that. So, uh, so th that's yeah, just a few of the examples and there are many more uh, sort of uh, conceptual questions that come up when you start thinking about the sitter space. Uh, for my uh, perspective, uh, since I'm going to be using kind of essentially yeah, toy models or these low dimensional uh, uh, quantum systems as potential holographic duals, um, the natural context to start thinking about the sitter space uh, is initially in the three dimensional the sitter space in two plus one dimensions. And in that case, there's already kind of a, uh, at least some phenomenology that one can try to reproduce from the point of view of, of the holographic theory. Uh, and uh, so in 2 plus 1 the sitter space, there is actually a Schwarzschild the sitter solution. Uh, it's not really uh, a black hole in the sitter space time. The sitter space time, as I just explained, in the, uh, in the static patch actually has a horizon, which is the de sitter horizon. Uh, and in 2 plus 1 dimension, uh, putting a massive object in, in the uh, gravity theory amounts to essentially creating a conical deficit, if you wish. Uh, and that conical deficit um, is um, uh, responsible basically for changing the, uh, the size of the horizon. Uh, and this is essentially how putting mass in the sitter space leads to a thermodynamic uh, yeah, uh, uh, back reaction, if you wish. Um, the metric uh, of uh, Schwarzschild de Sitter is written up there. And I'm going to write down uh, actually another version of the de Sitter Schwarzschild metric over here, um, which is actually just looking like the original de Sitter metric. Uh, if I work in Euclidean space, then this is a plus sign. It could be a minus sign if it's in Laurentian space time. Uh, let me for a moment do Euclidean. So this is just ADS2, uh, or Euclidean, uh, and if there's a minus sign, it's AD, uh, sorry, DS2. Uh, and then, indeed, we have the uh, radial, uh, sorry, the angular direction there. Um, and so this is just the sitter space time, and it turns out that um, Schwarzschild the sitter uh, space time is, is actually of the same form, uh, except that now the uh, angle phi, so basically there's a rescaling between these coordinates and those coordinates uh, where phi uh, is going to be periodic by some uh, deficit angle which I'm going to denote by theta. Uh, actually, by, for some uh, reason, I'm going to denote it by 2 theta, actually. Um, uh, we'll see later why it's called 2 theta. Um, uh, and 2 theta, uh, in this case, again, is, uh, is that square root thing. Uh, divided by 2 pi, actually, uh, m 1 minus uh, 8 g newton uh, times the energy. Um, and indeed, as you can see, the fact that now the, uh, the, the angle uh, of the horizon has been reduced by the int introduction of the mass leads to the change in the, um, in the, uh, the entropy. Uh, one thing I should briefly point out is that uh, indeed, uh, Time, Euclidean time, also needs to be periodic. Um, and indeed, uh, the, the usual requirement uh, is that you want to have r, r equals 1, which, which is where the hor uh, horizon sits. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, where the horizon sits. Uh, you want that to be a smooth part of space time. Uh, in this particular coordinate system, uh, actually, beta in this case happens to be just equal to 2 pi. Uh, but actually, if you go back to that coordinate system, and it corresponds to uh, that temperature that I've written over there. <laughs> right, so this is, yeah, again, the sitter um, comes with many puzzles. Uh, one of the things is uh, because, indeed, if you add a conical deficit mass in the sitter space, you're actually reducing its entropy. Um, so, so there's a certain sense in which the sitter space has negative uh, temperature. Uh, if you think about the, the type of thermodynamics of how you actually have to sort of think about energy in this, this space, uh, one can kind of argue that there should be a minus sign there. But again, it's one of those puzzles. Now, the question is, can we reproduce this by a microscopic uh, theory? Uh, and up to now, we've not been able to do that. There have been some proposals in the literature 
Um, and, and typically those proposals indeed uh, correspond to, uh, have to do with conformal field theories, but in a funny regime, uh, and in particular where the central charge uh, may take uh, unusual values. Um, so anyway, so, so I'm going to basically give a proposal for how to eventually do them, uh, a holographic dual of this particular space-time. Another observation that I briefly want to make is the following, is that in the limit where this theta becomes very small, then phi is actually, the deficit angle is actually such that, that the, the, the two plus one dimensional space-time just becomes a sliver. Uh, and indeed, in terms of the Penrose diagram, and let me still draw the, uh, the Penrose coordinates a little bit, at least where it's a little bit more obvious what the Penrose description is. Um, and if R, R is equal to uh, some basically Kruskal coordinates uh, like that, where I have light core coordinates U and V, uh, and I still have this R squared D phi squared. So in the limit, again, where, where this theta is small, uh, then essentially this d phi squared direction becomes very small. And you can think about this component of the metric as essentially an extra field just living on this two-dimensional ADS, uh, DS2 space-time. And this space basically plays the role of the dilaton field. So just by dimensionally reducing this theory in the limit where theta becomes small, we basically get uh, two-dimensional de Sitter space-time uh, with a dilaton gravity type theory. Uh, and then, indeed, the Penrose diagram is as indicated uh, on, the, on, the, on the previous slide, uh, where, indeed, uh, the horizon, again, sits here. Um, and then uh, one interesting thing to observation is that this deficit angle to theta kind of sits here. Um, this is the horizon. Uh, this space-time naturally has a symmetry where basically time goes up here, time goes down here. So 2 theta is also sits here. Uh, and, and similar as sort of in the two-sided ADS geometry, it's sort of natural to think about time going up there and time going down here. Another observation that I briefly want to make is that this beta is periodicity in time. Uh, and from this perspective, um, it actually it's a conical deficit uh, that uh, sits here along the horizon. Uh, and precisely this requirement is the requirement that the horizon is smooth. Okay, so that those are comments that will become important later. So this is just uh, observations about 2 plus 1 the sitter. Are there any questions at this point? Because then I'm going to switch to SYK. Yes. Correct, uh, and that's not the topic of my talk right now. But yeah, yeah if you have a question, right? yeah, there's only one horizon. That's correct. Yeah, but, uh, and there are all kinds of issues that come up if you have Schwarzschild the sitter in higher dimensions because of the two horizons. Yes. R is a function of U and V, uh, but if it's a component of the metric, then it becomes a field. Uh, and indeed, uh, if I identified that component of the metric with the field, then in some sense, if the, the thing that I would call the dilaton in, in two-dimensional uh, two dilat uh, dilaton gravity, let me call it by phi, it's essentially proportional to R, uh, maybe even with a, a prefactor of theta. Uh, so, so indeed, uh, yeah, uh, the extra dimension is opening up with angle theta. Uh, uh, and, and that's sort of the, the, the background value for the dilaton. So uh, indeed, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically uh, provide a dictionary uh, which, uh, from the point of view of formal identifications, is actually pretty well, as well, well controlled uh, uh, because I'm going to compare three things. By the way, do I have a pointer? No, I don't. Uh, is there the top thing? Is this pointing? Yeah, there it is. Okay, good small little red dot. Uh, so uh, the SYK model uh, in, uh, is, is, has been exactly solved. Uh, and one can actually compute correlation functions in the SYK model. Uh, and in particular, in the double-scaled SYK uh, limit, uh, it's, a, it's actually a very geometric theory. Uh, and it's pretty clear that it actually has a particular um, um, a quantum geometric interpretation. Uh, 
indeed, it's already known uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, solving this SYK model uh, in the double scaling limit that there's some connection with some Liouville type theory. Uh, and uh, Liouville theory is, a, is an example of a conformal field theory. Um, and indeed, one can take uh, the collective field theory of the SYK model and make a comparison with CFT conformal field theory in two dimensions. Separately, and this is an old story, uh, conformal field theory in two dimensions indeed are connected to 2 plus 1 John Simons theories. This is well known from the case of Wesselmini Witten theories. But the same thing is actually true that for Liouville theory or VR Zorro CFT, uh, and, and even in recent literature, there, there are papers that work out quite explicitly the, the dictionary between gravity in 2 plus 1 dimensions uh, and properties of uh, essentially VR Zorro CFT in two dimensions. So there's an also a pretty direct connection here. Uh, and it indeed turns out that the quantities that appear in the explicit expression of the SYK model have direct interpretations also as expectation values of, of, of appropriate Wilson line configurations in, in this uh, 3 plus 1 gravity theory, and it using this Trent Simons theory formulation. Now, the last question is, of course, a lot of this Virazoro CFT and um, Liouville theory typically connect with ADS spacetimes. Why is it a, a Citrus spacetime? And as we'll see, it turns out that the, one, the CFT that connects with the SYK model has complex central charge. Uh, and precisely also the Chun Simons theory that one needs for DS3 gravity is a type of Chun Simons theory that also leads to conformal field theories on its boundary that has complex central charge. So this is the, the outline. Um, again, there are a lot of relations here. Uh, so there's a lot of technical detail, or at least the story in some sense is relatively long and, and elaborate. Uh, but the connections here have been sort of pretty well studied in, in independently. Uh, so now the question is, how does it fit all together? Uh, and I'm just going to, um, basically in the next slides, they, they might look, maybe have some formulas on it, but essentially just repeating this particular story, but just with a few more formulas. Here's the SYK model. Uh, this is just indicating that it's sort of an all-to-all -all interaction model. You have a bunch of Majorana excitations uh, that are these oscillators, and you have this interaction, uh, which is, a, a, in this case, a pth order interaction, psi to the power p with random couplings uh, with this Gaussian variance. Um, and again, I, I don't, I'm not going to explain too much about what it does, but it has, yeah, uh, famously, uh, maximal chaos. Um, which, by the way, I should say, uh, and the fact that it leads to Lyapunov behavior, which is like exponential dependence on initial conditions, uh, it's not a bad place to start from if you want to be a dual to the sitter space, uh, because the sitter space also has the same exponential <laughs> divergence of trajectories, just by taking two points at the same, at a certain distance, that you start that's, that's the exponential expansion of the universe, if you wish. So if there is a connection with the sitter space, it's pretty appealing. Now, uh, in order to reformulate this theory, so you can try to solve it using Springer Dyson equations, but you can also sort of be more clever and go to what's called then a, a dynamical mean field description in terms of this bi-local field theory. Uh, and this is already the, the, the dictionary, uh, this quantity, which is the, uh, the bi-local quantity, which is the two-point function. Uh, and this is already the first order uh, explanation of the first step in a holographic, adding a holographic extra dimension, where essentially we go from a one-dimensional uh, SYK model to something that seemingly lives in two dimensions, uh, which is this, this uh, thing that depends on two coordinates, tau1 and tau2. So the, so the theory, so, so the coordinate system tau1, tau2 will play a role in, 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 the, next, uh, in the next story. Uh, but this is actually the, the space on which the two-dimensional CFT is going to live. And indeed, this variable, uh, this two-point function variable, essentially will start playing the role of a Liouville field living in two dimensions. It is the same coordinate, uh, but we're going to essentially sort of double the system uh, by... by, by um, uh, viewing this g as a variable that depends on, on, on two coordinates. Um, uh, and that's sort of natural in part because of the fact that the uh, SYK model by itself is not literally, if you, if, you do the, if you view it as a disordered model, it's not maybe literally at that point um, after disorder averaging a, a usual quantum mechanical system uh, because it becomes bilocal 
in, in after integrating out the uh, the Gaussian uh, random variables. Now there's a, a, a procedure which I'm not again going to outline, uh, where indeed one essentially writes, uh, yeah, solves for the ex for the um, uh, effective uh, Lagrangian of this variable g, uh, and it turns out that if you take this double scaling limit where p, the num the order of the interaction goes to infinity n goes to infinity, uh, that's important for s, y, k, but we're keeping this particular ratio p squared over n fixed. Uh, th that we're going to call lambda. Uh, uh, it turns out that this particular variable, if you replace it by essentially in, in the form of an exponential of some field little g, uh, that the effective action of this little g looks like so. And this is Liouville theory. Uh, the Liouville theory actually lives indeed on this uh, bilocal sort of space, the space of tau 1s and tau 2s. It's, it's a Lorentzian signature because this is a Lorentzian signature kinetic term. Uh, it has an exponential interaction. That exponential interaction is precisely basically the SYK interaction. Uh, but now written in terms of this variable G, and it's just it's higher powers of the size if you turn that back. But uh, importantly, the pre-coefficient of the action has a finite uh, uh, value, uh, which is uh, n over p squared. So this, this theory is, is now at this level, in the double scale theory, a quantum theory. Uh, in, the, in the actual large n limit where p fixed, this theory can be treated classically. But in the, uh, in the double scale uh, limit, it, it, uh, it has to be treated um, classic, uh, yeah, um, uh, quantum mechanically. Uh, a short uh, comment, if, if you put the SYK model uh, on a thermal circle, uh, this bilocal space of tau 1 and tau 2 actually lives on a Möbius strip um, uh, because it basically becomes the product of two circles where there's an identification between interchanging tau 1 and tau 2 uh, and that um, 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 becomes a Möbius strip. Another comment I should say is that even though the action is real, it actually goes in the exponent with a real pre-coefficient. Um, the kinetic term is Lorentzian, so we're missing a factor of i uh, in the usual way. Uh, and this is the origin of why this is actually a, a, a conformal field theory with complex central charge. Here I'm going to just flash uh, a few formulas uh, before I get sort of think a little bit more about that, uh, that theory. Uh, and um, it, it turns out that you can write down the explicit uh, correlation function. Here I'm writing down a, two, a finite temperature two-point function. And the finite temperature two-point function is written by an integral over the, uh, by a trace, which is an integral over energies. Uh, but since I have this, uh, the operator, so this is an operator insertion, it divides up the interval into two segments, with each with their own energy. Uh, so I'm integrating over those two energies with a spectral density and essentially a, a, a two-point function, or it's actually sort of a three-point function because it couples the label of the uh, field that's propagating kind of in the bulk, if you wish, uh, to the energies on each side. And this is just the, 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 the Euclidean time dependence. Here I simplified the formulas a little bit. Uh, I wrote them down in terms of theta functions. Often they're write down, written down in terms of other quantities, which I'll briefly write on the blackboard, um, namely where um, uh, often one writes down these kind of funny symbols. Um, uh, by the way, if I do a plus minus uh, in this thing, uh, you actually uh, uh, mean to take the product over all signs that are in that expression. Uh, this thing is called a Pochhammer symbol. Uh, it turns out that those expressions can also be written uh, in terms of uh, something like this. So they kind of look indeed like, like um, uh, partition functions. Uh, another uh, thing I should point out, uh, meaning, meaning partition functions, say, of, of some kind of quantum system. Uh, uh, and it turns out that this thing is called a, a, a quantum dilogarithm. Uh, and this thing indeed uh, occurs everywhere in computations uh, in, in, uh, in this three-dimensional Chen Simons theory that I mentioned. Uh, and if you take the square of this quantity, you get basically those theta functions. 
two other things that are properties of double-scaled SYK, which are kind of very intriguing, I find. Uh, one is indeed uh, the formula for the energy, uh, which is up here. Uh, so there's an angle theta that's been introduced here uh, that labels the energy. Okay, let me go back. Um, that labels the energy through a cosine theta. And the, ba the way this has been obtained is essentially by taking the SYK model and essentially summing over all the diagrams. Those are called core diagrams. And then you can construct a, a, a transfer matrix. And if you diagonalize the transfer matrix, uh, the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix have that form. It's the cosine of a theta. Um, so that's extremely interesting. It means that the energy is, is actually bounded in a finite range. That's already completely different than, a, than conformal field theories or in ADS-CFT, where black holes can be arbitrarily massive and energies can go arbitrarily high up. So there's a finite range of energies in this theory, which is actually the same as what one has in the sitter space, where also energy is bounded. It's used to study ADS-2. By the way, let me make one comment. Yes, yeah, it's used to study ADS2. Uh, let me make one comment. Um, the entropy formula that I had previously on the blackboard uh, was this, was this, was the entropy of the, of the, the, the sitter, black Schwarzschild, the sitter. In the limit where this, uh, I'm go approaching uh, the branch root uh, cut of this square root, this looks like a square root of linear in the energy. So indeed, in, in if, I, if I'm very close to where the square root is equal to zero, I'll have a, 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 an entropy that goes like the square root of the energy. And that's the hallmark of ADS2 gravity. Uh, namely, that's the Cardi formula, if you wish. Uh, so indeed, there's a regime where these things are studied. And indeed, um, uh, if, you look at, if you look very close to the tip of this particular spectral density, if you look closely here, uh, it will look uh, indeed like uh, the cinch um, uh, contribution of the entropy of the Swatch and quantum mechanics, which is dual, dual to ADS2. So the idea is that the same model describes ADS2 and ADS2 depending on which end of the range I'm saying? Yeah, but there, there are a couple of more things to that. But OK, that's one of the ideas. And let me still make one other comment here is that Right, so here the spectral density is looking like this. It goes up, which, so in this regime here, it looks almost like it could have been just an ordinary CFT because the spectral density goes up. But then there's a, a maximum where the spectral density actually has a maximum. Um, and, uh, and then it actually goes, goes down again. So there's a negative slope uh, in, 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 the, in the entropy. So this, this is very interesting, and it means that there are indeed different regimes where the theory will behave qualitatively quite differently. So indeed, uh, it turns out that uh, basically this is, this is actually not a formula for the, uh, for the e to the power of the entropy. Um, uh, and it turns out that if you semi-classically evaluate this thing, uh, it turns out to be 1 over lambda times uh, a classical die logarithm. Uh, and actually, if you if you work this thing out, uh, it's actually just a Gaussian. So so the thing to explain uh, is 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 why does SYK have this Gaussian um, entropy? Um, uh, and and I should say that that um, uh, uh, the entropy. Uh, that I got in my previous um, discussion of, of the sitter space doesn't look like that. Uh, uh, the sitter uh, black hole turns out to have this entropy. Um, uh, and, oh, sorry, it's uh, not 2 pi, it's uh, 2 times uh, theta times the, the sitter radius. So in the sitter units, it's 2 times theta. So that's the, the thing of the conical deficit. And it turns out that SYK has this particular Gaussian uh, entropy formula. 
so the rest of my talk is basically to try to explain that for I'm going to explain that formula from the point of uh, the set of gravity. Okay. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I'll go a little bit quick here uh, because this is just sort of uh, explaining the, the, the slide that I had before about the different connections. This is just the statement in formulas uh, is that the, uh, yeah, the, the, the gravity theory, if you do this thing in two plus one dimensions of uh, basically repackaging your metric and your uh, uh, spin connection in, 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 sp in, in uh, uh, how do you call that, uh, gauge connections, then uh, the Einstein action takes this particular form. Um, and what's very nice is that the, um, uh, yeah, so we precisely get this particular combination where, where, where the, uh, the central charge is actually um, uh, imaginary. Uh, and now if I do the usual way of sort of going from a Chern Simons theory to a theory that lives on the, on the boundary, yes, Juan. Yeah, correct. There is an. Uh, there's an. Yeah, thank you. There's an S zero contribution. Yes. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, let, let's postpone that question for now. Uh, for now, I'm indeed looking more at the thermodynamics uh, as the theta dependence, but indeed, uh, it's a good question. So. Um, uh, yeah, so basically the point is that if you, if you go to the boundary and if you so basically make the dictionary between uh, the, central the, uh, the central term or the pre-coefficient of the Chern Simons theory uh, with the pre-coefficients of the, of the corresponding boundary system, which in this case is a Liouville theory, uh, then you find that the central charge of this theory here uh, is parameterized in a funny way. This is the usual Liouville type of parameterization of the central charge. There's a sum coefficient that's called b, which usually sits in front of the, uh, the, the exponential. Um, and indeed, there's a relationship between this coefficient k, that coefficient b. If you work out all those formulas, uh, it turns out basically that what you're looking at uh, is what lives on the boundary are two Liouville theories, uh, one with central charge 13 plus an imaginary number and the other one with central charge 13 minus an imaginary number. To me, that's extremely suggestive. Uh, basically, what it tells you is that the boundary system of, of uh, the set of gravity uh, is indeed a CFT, but it's a sum of two CFTs with total central charge 26. That rings a bell. Um, uh, and it means that we should think about these two CFTs as being coupled uh, with the BZ ghost system, uh, which indeed is, is natural. Uh, because of the fact that I said that gravity is not decoupled in the sitter space. Um, uh, and therefore, um, indeed, um, I'm going to treat this thing as, as, a, as a system where gravity couples the two uh, uh, Liouville systems. Um, it's true that in the... So if you take, uh, if you take the... Uh, the n to infinity limit, which actually is, is, is uh, the large central charge limit of this theory, you get um, JT gravity. Um, um, but if you keep the central charge finite, basically you get JT gravity where instead of the linear uh, term times the, the potential is not linear, it turns out to be a sign of the dilaton field. So if the dilaton potential is this, the sign of the dilaton field, you got this action. Because basically that sign is just the sum of the two Liouville um, uh, uh, potentials. Okay, um, so anyway, so we have basically two Liouville theories, uh, which also means, in some sense means that we have two SYK models. Uh, because each of those Liouville theories kind of corresponds to an SYK model. Because uh, indeed the SYK model precisely, I should say, leads to uh, uh, a Liouville theory with precisely this central complex central charge. So that's indeed uh, a match. Uh, I'm going to just flash this slide, uh, because one reason I'm flashing this slide is that up to now, this talk that I've given now, I gave it already four years ago. Um, 
at, uh, actually also on this continent at a, at a, at a, um, uh, at a conference in, in uh, Argentina. Um, and I also gave it in, in a few other times. So the, all these formal connections were things that were kind of clear. The thing to me, that to me was not obvious is how to interpret these formulas from the point of view of, of uh, the De Sitter gravity. Uh, and that's the extra thing that I'm uh, going to talk about today. And this is two other extra results that we uh, obtained uh, in, 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 the, in, in the recent uh, time. How many? Five more minutes? Ten more minutes? Okay, thank you. Perfect. So it turns out that if you start doing computations in Liouville theory, um, one of the little mysteries uh, of the SYK model is indeed this formula where the energy of SYK is, is the cosine of some theta. Uh, I should still say the fact that the energy of SYK is, is parameterized by an angle is another enormously important hint that we're talking about the sitter gravity and not about anti de sitter gravity. Because if you, uh, if you think about anti de Sitter gravity, then energies are parameterized, uh, are connected, for example, with the BTZ black hole energy. And the BTZ black hole is obtained by dividing out anti de Sitter space by isometries. And those isometries are actually boosts. They're hyperbolic Cronje-Gazi classes of the, of the isometry group. And those are not parameterized by angles. They're, they're parameterized by a real number. The only thing that I know of that are parameterized by angles are rotations. So clearly, if I want to sort of identify uh, a geometric dual to the SYK um, uh, yeah, a system, it should be parameterized by an angle. And I claim again that that angle is this, this angle here. Uh, in the case of Liouville theory, it was also a little bit mysterious why there would be an angle in the story. And it turns out that the way in which uh, you could do computations in Liouville theory uh, as I mentioned, this system lives actually on a, on a Möbius strip. Uh, and the Möbius strip can be viewed as sort of a, uh, a strip that sits between two boundaries. One boundary is an actual boundary. And that boundary can have a boundary cosmological constant. And it turns out that for this complex Liouville theory, that the way which one conventionally parameterizes the boundary cosmological constant in Liouville theory indeed uh, is parameterized by means of the cosine of the thing that indeed parameterizes the energy of the Liouville theory. In ordinary Liouville theory, it's a cosine hyperbolic. For the complex Liouville, it's a cosine. So that's a nice match. There's also the out that there's a formula in, in a, a beautiful paper by uh, Samological, one of the Samological brothers, uh, that actually is looking at generalized minimum models. Uh, and he precise, his formulas precisely imply that the DOZZ formula, where you multiply the DOZZ formulas of the two Liouville theories, precisely uh, packages into the expressions that you find in the correlation functions of the SYK. Um, so that's another hint that there is a connection. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the actual dictionary will probably involve uh, a doubling of the SYK model. Uh, and I'm viewing this sort of as a version of SYK where you kind of couple it, quote unquote, to gravity. The easiest way of doing that is the following. It's basically by taking another copy of the SYK model, call one of them, one of them your matter theory, call the other one your gravity theory. Um, uh, and if they have the same spectrum, then I can go to a physical subspace uh, where, where the two energies are identical. Which means that there's some kind of Hamiltonian constraint that this thing solves. solves. And I can think about that Hamiltonian constraint as basically the, the Hamiltonian constraint of a reparameterization invariant version of the double theory. Uh, and this is how I'm coupling the two systems. And it's that reparameterization invariance that actually will allow the connection with the higher dimensional uh, conformal field theory. OK, uh, I'm going to now ask some questions, and then I'm going to do the computation of trying to uh, verify this formula from the point of view of the De Sitter gravity. Are there questions at this point besides the questions that I have on that slide? Does anyone have answers to those questions on the slide? <laughs> uh, I'm going to maybe say something about the top one. Uh, and I'll make a, a comment without doing any computations about the bottom one. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to explain this formula for you. Uh, and it kind of follows from this uh, picture here. Uh, 
So as I mentioned, this is sort of the Penrose diagram of this two-dimensional, the citrus space time. Uh, but actually, if I open up uh, the extra dimension, uh, where, where this phi has a non-zero uh, periodicity, uh, you should actually add an extra dimension to this thing, which means that this line that goes in this direction may not necessarily intersect with the other line. So they're kind of one of them is, is above the other one. And then if you squint and you look at this thing, this thing is a tetrahedron. Um, turns out that this, what I have to compute is essentially the, essentially the volume of that tetrahedron. And it turns out that, that uh, famously these, these dilogarithms are uh, complex volumes of tetrahedra, of complex tetrahedra. And the volume of a hyperbolic tetrahedron in two plus one dimension has a natural imaginary part, and that imaginary part is the Chin Simons action. Um, if you take the sum of the two Chin Simons action, you have to take these two combinations. Uh, and it turns out that the actual hyperbolic volume of space time that you would, uh, of a hyperbolic tetrahedra that you would compute in anti Dositta space would have a minus sign here, essentially. Uh, whereas uh, here it has a plus sign. Okay, let me still make that comment. Now, if I think about this thing as a hyperbolic tetrahedron, um, it turns out that this thing is actually quite special, and indeed this particular formula is known as the, the volume of what's called an ideal um, uh, tetrahedron. Uh, and what is an ideal tetrahedron? Ideal tetrahedron is a tetrahedron like this, such that the corner points of the tetrahedra are sitting on the boundary of the anti Dositta space. That's called an ideal tetrahedron. So these four corner points are sitting indeed on the boundary. Now, uh, it turns out that if you take an ideal tetrahedron, then uh, these angles are not uh, independent. Uh, beta and theta are not independent. And one way of thinking about it is that if you have an ideal tetrahedron and you zoom in on this particular corner, uh, it actually kind of looks like this. Uh, you can kind of zoom in on it and then, let me not make, make too many drawings. Basically, it means that if you cut through here, you, you create a triangle. And if it's, a if it's an ideal tetrahedron, then that's, this should be a, a normal triangle whose angles add up to 180 degrees to pi. Now, I would claim that, that the pure SYK model uh, is a two-dimensional model, and basically it doesn't have any opening angle here. So this line here doesn't have any opening angle. And if that's the case, then beta is going to be restricted geometrically. So this is an ideal tetrahedron. Uh, and beta is actually pi minus 2 theta. Um, now, there's another thing that, uh, because this is quantum gravity, uh, beta and theta actually are not canonically, are not independent variables. They're also canonically conjugate variables. Indeed, theta basically parameterizes an opening angle, and therefore it parameterizes the length of the, uh, the geodesic that sits on the end of the opening angle. And it turns out that in gravity, uh, the length and the angle of a, of, a, uh, of a geodesic are naturally canonically conjugate. So beta and theta uh, actually satisfy this equation relation, uh, commutation relation. That beta commu commuted with two theta, I apologize for the two. The two is simply because in the SYK model there's conventionally a two here. That's why I'm putting that two there. Uh, this is uh, h bar or i h bar. Uh, let me not worry about factors of i, although they kind of are important. Um, h bar actually is 1 over lambda. So there's this, this relation. Uh, and then, indeed, if I take this relation and I take that relation, and I try to uh, find a wave function uh, that, uh, on which this relation is implemented, uh, it turns out that's indeed basically what e to the power, what this thing actually is. So e to the s should satisfy the equation uh, that, uh, that the dd2 theta 
times h uh, times h bar minus pi minus two theta on e to the s uh, of theta should be equal to zero. This equation I've derived basically from geometry, uh, from the De Sitter geometry. Uh, if you solve this equation, uh, you find this answer. Uh, because indeed, uh, the s d2 theta uh, should be equal to pi minus 2 theta. So, so th uh, that, that is the explanation of, of this particular formula. Uh, it's, it's both good news and bad news. It means we have interpreted it in, in terms of the Sitter geometry. The bad news is that beta is not equal to 2 pi. Um, and there's actually a conical deficit sitting here. In terms of the dilaton, it actually means that the dilaton is linear here. It turns out to be constant over here. So, there's a, a, a so that's the interpretation of that thing. If I have one more minute, then uh, I can give you a proposal of what we should do in SYK to get this thing as the entropy. Um, So as I explained, this particular relation here uh, corresponds to uh, a geometric requirement that comes from the fact that this is an ideal tetrahedron because we're uh, reaching this bottom corner. And it kind of means that there's charge conservation happening here, that if I want to create this conical deficit here, I automatically also need to create a conical deficit that sits here. Uh, that sort of combined add up to pi. So what I'm going to do is I'm basically, I want to create the Schwarzschild black hole, Schwarzschild the Sitter black hole. The way I have to do that is by inserting a Wilson line that creates uh, basically the black hole. And if I insert that Wilson line above here so that I don't reach the boundary, I can create a state in this case that doesn't reach the boundary uh, and therefore does not have that particular constraint. In practice, what it means in SYK is I, I need to do this um, uh, a computation uh, where I need to compute uh, the following uh, thing. So I have basically the thermal circle, but I'm drawing it like this. And um, let me go back in slides a little bit to the formulas for SYK. Um, so I'm going to put a Wilson line here with some conformal dimension delta. And I'm going to create uh, a conical deficit, th 2 theta here and a 2 theta here. So I'm not taking the pure thermal circle, but I'm creating now the conical deficit um, uh, by means of a, a Wilson line early and a Wilson line late. It turns out that if you compute this particular uh, the entropy of this, or the correlation function of this thing, the question I should ask, what is the spectral density of, uh, that uh, SYK has in this channel? The way to do that is to compute this particular partition function and to see what the, spec what the theta dependence of that partition function is. You find, indeed, uh, that there's a, a spectral density that comes just from the, the sum over intermediate states but then there's also a correlation function from the insertion, the two-point function, which is the C thing over here, the coefficient C. And if you compute that coefficient C in terms of the theta dependence, it looks like this. So what you're going to find is e to the minus 2 pi, oh sorry, no, two, uh, yeah, 2 pi theta over lambda. Uh, and, um, and it turns out that this pi over lambda is actually precisely equal to that particular r, if you do the dictionary. Um, uh, the minus sign uh, looks worrisome, uh, but that has to do with the fact that we're probably sitting on the right side of that particular um, uh, thing. So this is uh, of the, of the uh, spectral distribution. So this is the proposal for potentially starting to study uh, the De Sitter-Schwarzschild black hole using 
uh, uh, double scaled SYK. Um, maybe I should stop here and indeed um, end with the uh, a list of questions that I had on my last slide. Thank you. Questions? I want to understand uh, this duality more explicitly. Please correct, correct me if, if, I, if I am wrong. Yes. So uh, this is like uh, we have gravity in three dimensions. Uh, so actually, okay. We have gravity in three dimensions, so actually digital geometry, and that is dual to two-dimensional uh, level theory, right? And this two-dimensional level theory is double scaled SYK. Is that correct? Let me just say this. Um, there are relationships between uh, uh, double scaled SYK and two dimensional level theory with complex central charge. One can make those diction, uh, one can find those relations. And this was already noted, uh, actually, papers already in the papers by Juan and, and, and Douglas, uh, essentially. Uh, so that relationship is there. The relationship between Sean Simon's theory and the level theory is there as well. Okay. Uh, and at this point, I'm just sort of combining, at least l let me just summarize this, is that there are so many hints that there are, that there is a direct sort of geometric dictionary yeah, okay. between pure gravity in 2 plus 1 uh, uh, the sitter space and double scaled SYK, that we should take that seriously uh, and that we should get to the bottom of it, of what the dictionary is between the two sides. Uh, here I'm making a proposal, at least geometrically, of how to interpret the entropy of the, of the, uh, uh, of the double-scaled SYK in terms of basically that particular geometric setup. And it's true that the two things are, at least have the same answer. Uh, the question is, what does it mean physically? And that will require more study. So uh, uh, this uh, large central charge limit up two dimensions, JT gravity leads to the level theory, right? So is this uh, always true in general D dimension, or this is just specific to two dimension gravity? This is still specific to lower dimension. At least, yeah, the, the, there are people that have tried to sort of uh, increase this to hi higher dimensions, but so far it's still uh, between 2D and uh, systems, and 1D, 2D, and 3D systems. Okay. Thank you. I'm going. Um, so I was wondering what is the relation between this story and uh, the story in Euclidean ADS? Because, for example, right. I guess in the study of, uh, for example, not a theory, Correct. you're considering not complements, and those are hyperbolic spaces, and Correct. you also have these tetrahedra as like the volumes, I think, are even right. uh, topological invariants, right? So they are really not Correct. There, so there are these computations that people have been doing. So, uh, um, uh, 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 yes, good, very good question. So, so it's true that, that the, the formulas that actually I raised them, these quantum dialogarithms and these classical dialogarithms all show up indeed in, in these hyperbolic spaces that are obtained by indeed doing the same game with the conical deficits, but then in Euclidean ADS-3. Yeah. As Juan also explained yesterday, there's, there's actually sort of a relation between Euclidean ADS-3 and the Sitter space. Uh, and, and one of the questions is precisely whether the double-scaled SYK is doing the analytic continuation in the right way to go from ADS3 to um, now uh, to, to DS3. Uh, and, and it turns out that at least in terms of the interpretations of the volumes, uh, I would say yes, um, that, that, there are, that, that the signs in... in um, in, uh, in, in double-scaled SYK. Plus there are all these uh, need the appropriate factors of I. And I should say that really the, the, the other evidence is indeed that if you look at uh, the Chen Simons theories that, we, that are uh, related to Euclidean ADS3, that's an SO2R Chen Simons theory. It has a real uh, Chen Simons uh, pre coefficient. The corresponding quantum group has a Q parameter that sits on the unit circle. Whereas here, the quantum group uh, has a Q parameter that sits between 0 and 1. So there are all kinds yeah. of places where factors of I go uh, that, that suggest that you were actually kind of sitting in the other signature. I see. Because one comment I could make maybe is that I know from, uh, from not theory, I guess, that, um, for example, the, 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 this equation you wrote down, this condition, it looks very similar to certain sort of topological recursion relations you could impose on, uh, on these not, uh, not invariants. Right. So it would be nice, I mean, if you could 
Make no, some right. H so bar expansion or something and even compute like, uh, I mean. Yeah, so this is a semi-classical way yeah, of yeah. writing it. Uh, if you don't do it semi-classical, like then, it uh, uh, yeah. then it becomes a recursion relation. Then you basically have to do the exchange relation between the exponentials of, you basically have to exponentiate yeah, this yeah. thing. Uh, and the exponentiation of that thing when you solve the corresponding equation gives you the quantum logarithm. Because in the sort of this quantum curve business, I think it looks very similar to, uh, to right. what's happening. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. So let let's go one yeah, more. Yeah. 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 So so let me let me say it for so so the best way I could um, propose it I think would be need be to take uh, two copies of the Euclidean uh, SYK. Um, and, and they start looking at these bilocal observables. And then the time direction in the, the sitter space time is the distance between the operators that are acting in one and the other. So, 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 so can, yeah, so, so there's an intermediate step, which is kinematic space. And then expanding, uh, going forward in time, is, is, is moving the two operators. So, so, so the time direction in the SYK would be simultaneous, becomes the space like. Uh, uh, translation, uh, but then the relative time comes to the time in the set of space. And this is what uh, flips the signature. And one observation, of course, is that ADS2 and DS2 are just literally just rotating by 90 degrees. All right, so um, let's go for a break. Let's come back 11.20. Yep, thanks, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>